Galen Maxwell docket update. We're looking at November 23rd, 2021. Not as busy of a day as yesterday, the 22nd. We can see we're going to jump right into the minute entries on the docket. 1123, we have an order. As to Glenn Maxwell, says here, as discussed at today's conference, attached is the court's draft preliminary instructions for the sworn jury. So this is coming out from the court. Let's take a look at what this document looks like. It's going to download here and let's zoom on in. So says here, this was filed 1123. As discussed at yesterday's conference, attached is the court's draft preliminary instructions for the sworn jury. The court has considered both parties' proposed instructions as to the court's order that certain witnesses be permitted to testify or refer to by first name only or by pseudonym. Oh my gosh. The draft preliminary instructions include a limiting instruction regarding this process. Parties may suggest any proposed edits to the preliminary instructions by letter. Those are due by November 27th, or they shall indicate by that date that they have no objections to the suggestions. Okay, so they're saying that the both sides here, Galen's attorneys, the government's attorneys, they've come up with some draft instructions that when witnesses are presented in the court, they don't use their full names, they only use their first names, or they can use a pseudonym. So I'm Robert Gruler, but in court, I'm only Robert, or I'm Charlemagne testifying in court. All right. So we've got the parties also may suggest those edits. And so if the court, if they don't like these proposed instructions, then they can come up with whatever they want, or they can just let the court know we like them. No objections. This works for us. So let's take a quick look at what these are. Preliminary instructions to the sworn jurors. Now that you've been sworn, let me give you some instructions. You're sworn in now. The first step in the trial is going to be opening statements. Government's going to go first. I expect the defense to go first. Next, those statements are not evidence. They're just going to tell you about the case. After the opening statements, the government is then going to present its evidence. Testimony of witnesses. The government will examine the witnesses, and then the defendant's lawyers may cross-examine them. Again, because of the presumption of innocence, the government is going to present the case again if they want. So they get to go again. After the presentation of evidence is completed, closing arguments, following closing arguments, you're going to learn about the law. Burden of proof remains with the prosecution. Here's what I do. Here's what the jury does. What is evidence? What isn't evidence? Right? Pretty standard instructions explaining to the jurors, this is how you evaluate the evidence. There's no formula to do this for now. Suffice it to say that you bring with you in the courtroom all the experience in the background of your lives. So don't leave common sense outside the courtroom. Keep an open mind. Make sure you've heard of everything. As I mentioned during jury selection, this case has received and will continue to receive significant attention in the media. To protect their privacy, I have permitted witnesses, if they choose, to be referred to in open court by their first name or a pseudonym. Full names of witnesses are known to the government, the defendant, and to the court, and were shown to the jury and shown to you during jury selection. This process should not bear in any way on your evaluation of the evidence in this case. So in other words, they're saying, listen, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you might hear people whose names don't match. We, you, you might know his name is Robert, but because of what's happening here, he's going to go by Charlemagne today. Or uh, this individual, you, you might expect to hear the full name Robert Gruler, but it's just going to be Robert today. So uh, don't hold that against them if they choose to go that way. If, if, if they do that for their own safety or for their own privacy or whatever reason, don't hold that against them is what the court is instructing the jurors to do. Rules of conduct, don't talk to anybody about it. Don't communicate with anyone else. Don't go on websites like Twitter or LinkedIn or YouTube or Reddit. Don't go watch the Galen Maxwell and Robert Gruler's channel. Third, do not let anyone talk to you about the case or anyone who has anything to do with it. If a person should attempt to communicate with you, Either inside the courtroom, you must immediately report that to my deputy, Miss Williams, no one else. Miss Williams will report it to me. If anybody is interfering with these jurors, got to let the court know. To minimize the probability of any improper communication, it's important you go straight to the jury room when you come in in the morning. Do not linger in public areas of the courthouse. Fourth, do not do any research on your own. I know in this day and age it's tempting, but don't do it. 
Finally, you've each been given a notebook and a pen. That is because I permit jurors to take notes, but you do not have to take notes. Notes are just an aid to your own recollection. Court reporters in this case record everything that's said. If you do take notes, be aware that note taking may distract you from something important. Whether or not you take notes, rely on your own recollections. Don't be influenced by the fact that another juror has taken notes. So in other words, if you go into the deliberation room and you say, I remember this happening and another juror says, no, that's not what happened because I wrote it down. Don't be persuaded by that. You remember what the witness said. You don't have to be biased. Just because they wrote something down doesn't mean that they got it right. Trust your memory. It says, if you do take notes, all the notes must be left each day in the jury room. Miss Williams will make sure that they are secure. From this point, uh, point until the time you retire, don't discuss the case with anyone. These are my preliminary instructions, COVID rules, witnesses are going to be in plexiglass. We've got HEPA filters all over the place. This time, I'm going to ask you to give your undivided attention to the lawyers as they make their opening statement. So these are the preliminary instructions, right? Not the, the deliberating instructions, not the rule of law, but just sort of the preliminary instructions as soon as the jurors are sworn in. So if the both parties, if Galen's attorneys and the government's attorneys, if they're okay with these instructions, well, that's it. They just say, yeah, no objection. Sounds good. Works for us. Otherwise, they have until November 27th to respond and then they can fight over that which i'm sure that they will because this is galen maxwell's case so that's the order that came out on 11 23 we have another minute entry for the proceedings held before judge allison nathan so this is the final pre-trial conference that was held on 11 23 so it doesn't look like we're going to get the actual uh entry from the proceeding Defendant Galen Maxwell present with Bobby Sternheim, Jeff Pagliuca, Christian Everdell, Laura Menninger, four lawyers, government prosecutors, Laura Pomerantz, Maure Maureen Comey, James Comey's daughter, Allison Moe, Andrew Rohrbach. So four versus four. Court reporter, final pretrial conference held. There's a transcript somewhere, so uh, don't have that here on the docket, looks like. So we can continue on. 1123. A letter motion addressed to the judge. So this is from U.S. Attorney Maureen Comey. Proposed redaction to the Dietz Loftus materials. Document filed by the USA as to Galen Maxwell. So we have the Dietz Loftus materials. Let's see what these are all about. This is over from uh, the court document. A docket. Again, you can get these documents for free. I'm in the, the federal court's PACER system. But if you go to this recap archive, you can actually pull these documents up entirely on your own if you want to uh, read these in further detail. So, Dear Judge Nathan, this is the government writing the court. Pursuant to court order back on docket 482, government seeks redactions to Exhibit 1 to the defendant's response to the government's motion to preclude testimony of Dr. Dietz and Dr. Loftus. So, these are the redactions. The government's proposed redactions are, once again, consistent with Pyramid Co., that case, although the party's supplemental briefing and the court's opinion are judicial documents subject to common law presumption of access, the limited proposed redactions are narrowly tailored to protect the interest of the minor victims and the third parties, including individuals who have not identified themselves on the record in this case, subjects of the court's pseudonym order. The government does not seek redactions to the defense response or to the court's opinion. The defense has informed the government it's not seeking any additional redaction. So Damian Williams. So once again, there's an exhibit. They're talking about what's going to be said or what the exhibit entails. They're proposing redactions to this in the interest of protecting the minor victims and the unnamed people. So when it does hit the court dockets, we'll, we'll see what it looks like. It, 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 they're going to hash out what we can see and what we can't see. Government's saying it is all need, you know, needing to be protected. If the court agrees, we're, we'll get the document published with a bunch of the redaction. So it's about testimony of Dr. Dietz and Dr. Loftus. So maybe some patients or some other individuals who are involved in the case in some way, shape or form. Okay. So back to the docket. And it looks like we have one more event that happened on 11 23 this is a response to the motion by galen maxwell the motion to preclude the expert testimony of dr Dietz and dr loftus so let's see who these people are uh dear judge nathan nope we already read that one that was a pseudonym order so let's go over here all right so we've got the main document you can see this is massive 
massive filing. So we've got 28 pages in the main document, 375 pages, and then 159 pages in Exhibit 2. So let's explore some of this stuff. And again, we're going to pull these documents from Recap just so that we can save some clicks. We've got Glenn Maxwell, the response to the government's motion in limine to preclude expert testimony of Dr. Park Dietz and Dr. Elizabeth Loftus. All right, so very interesting. So let's see if we can figure out who these people are real quickly, get any details about them. He's a forensic psychiatrist who was consulted. Is that Sam Park Dietz? Dr. Park Dietz. Yeah, looks like him. Okay, separate company, forensic consulting firm specializing in criminal behavioral analysis. Testified in some of the highest profile U.S. criminal cases, including spousal killer Betty Broderick, mass murder Jared Lee Lohner, uh, Lofner, serial killers Joel Rifkin, Arthur Shawcross, Jeffrey Dahmer, my goodness, came to national prominence in 1982. So Galen Maxwell, this guy's 80, uh, 73 years old. He's on the defense team. He's a criminologist, 1987. So this guy, uh, this guy's, uh, you know, Harvard Medical School assistant professor of psychiatry. So yeah, you, if, if you're charged with a crime, yeah, he's a good person to have on your team. And so it sounds like the defense notified the government that uh, he's on their witness list. He's going to be testifying or communicating something in this case. And what the government is asking for now, you can see, is a motion in limine. So they want to preclude his testimony. They motion and limine sort of think about it like a motion to limit something, right? It's it's stopping Dr. Park Dietz from testifying. And so in this document, you have Glenn Maxwell's lawyers responding to that attempt to stop Dr. Park from testifying. So uh, we know who that is. Let's see who Dr. Elizabeth Loftus is. Search Google for this one. And she is the um, studies human memory experience. Her experiments reveal how memories can change things that are told, facts and ideas. She's an American cognitive sci uh, psychologist, expert on human memory. Let's make sure it's the same person, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus. Human memory, malle malleability of human memory. So she's going to come and uh, eviscerate any of the victims who say that something happened. She's, no, you don't re really remember that, do you? And the creation and the nature of false memories, including recovered memories of childhood sexual abuse. As well as her work inside the laboratory, Loftus has been involved in applying her research to legal settings. She's consulted, provided expert witnesses testimony for hundreds of cases. 2002, ranked 58th. The review of general psychology's list of the 100 most influential psychological researchers in the 20th century. Oh, man, I was just on Viva's channel and I was saying four to $5,000 an hour for this defense is uh, it's probably low now that I'm looking at some of these names. But all right, so uh, they are two people that the defense wanted to come and testify. The government is trying to stop them from testifying. This is 28 pages. So of course, if you want to go take a look at the full thing, you can. A uh, table of contents, let's take a quick look at this. Dr. Dietz's testimony is admissible. So again, this is this is the defense justifying why Dr. Dietz should be coming into court. Uh, one, he's responding to Dr. Rocchio's proposed testimony. So the government is bringing their own expert in, their own doctor, and Dr. Dietz is going to respond to them. So it's a sort of a rebuttal expert witness talking things about like hindsight bias, the halo effect, how these might prejudice certain witnesses. Somebody might look back on their history and, and even though something wasn't actual abuse, they might consider it to be abuse. Somebody might think that because they were close in proximity to somebody who was sexually abused, that maybe they were also sexually abused. Different pathways to false allegations of sexual assault. Dr. Dietz alleged opinions about the accuser's credibility. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And then the same thing, Dr. Loftus' testimony is also admissible. So you can see 28 pages here. A lot of different case cases are being cited. U.S. Constitution, introduction. The government asked this court to drastically limit the experts of Park and Loftus. Park, Dietz, and Loftus. Government motion seeks to unfairly capitalize on this court's decision, largely overruling Ms. Maxwell's Daubert challenge to the government's expert, Dr. Lisa Rocchio. The government gets his way 
Dr. Rocchio will present the jury with a one-sided version of the events, while Ms. Maxwell will be crippled in her ability to respond. This court should not permit the asymmetry the government hopes to create. No question, Dr. Dietz and Loftus are highly qualified, supremely qualified in their areas of expertise. There is a 374-page document that includes 11 exhibits describing the qualifications and the bases of the opinions that they're going to offer at trial. Let's take a look at that document. 375 pages. Here it is. And it certainly is 375 pages. Here, it, this is coming from Haddon Morgan Foreman. This is from Pagliuca and Menninger. Expert disclosure by the defense. So massive document. Look at this thing. It's expected that Dr. Loftus, he's a psychologist. He's going to be testifying on all of these things. Park Dietz, another psychology degree. Johns Hopkins, you know, professor of law, UCLA. Lots of stuff. Okay. Highly, highly qualified. Lots of background material. This is all just written by, that was all written by the defense team. Okay. Halo effects. This is why it's justified. False memory, intoxication, antisocial personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, psychotic disorders, disassociation. All of these things they're going to say are relevant because of this redacted sentence. Dr. Ryan Hall, so-and-so and so-and-so is uh, perfectly suited for an analysis by Dr. Ryan Hall. We don't know who that is. So still some redactions in here. Ms. Maxwell reserves the right to supplement this. So 15 pages of explanation and then the rest of these 360 pages are uh credentials <laughs> so this is dr loftus let's see how many pages she's got oh, you just keep going and going and going okay so she got all the way up to that was park deet so about oh about was it 15 it's about 45 pages is hers 60s down to let's see how long Dr. Dietz is. It just keeps going and going and going. The guy's 73, so it just keeps going. Might be the rest of the document. Uh, a lot. All right, a lot. Uh, about 100 pages. I don't even know if I don't even know where I am anymore. The guy's resume is so long. Okay, and then we have just uh, looks like pages and pages and pages of redacted documents. So from 212 all the way down to the rest, all the way down, not the entire document, but from page 212 to 319, all redacted. Can't see any of it. Blank, 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 black pages, nothing there. Then we pick back up page 320. We get some disclosure material, 3,500 material. And then we just get some more citations. Uh, Robert P. Kelso, somebody who works at a place called Forensic Pursuit. And just more credentials resume background so very very big document there <clears throat> 375 pages back to the original document over here responding to rocchio uh, argument some legal argument there talking that that his testimony is admissible and so we just go back through the rest of the table of contents and again 28 pages we're not going to go through the whole thing but you're seeing that they're trying to get their expert witnesses admitted maxwell has two highly qualified doctors come in and testify about what we can presume will be smashing the allegations of the victims alleged victims and the government does not want them to come and do that so they're saying judge we have to limit this defense is responding no we don't highly qualified perfectly admissible let it in judge the government does not call into question their quali qualifications rather the government claims their opinions invade the province of the jury or do not quote fit the case a hearing is not necessary or appropriate to resolve these arguments. These arguments fail on the merits. The government should deny, this should, court should deny the government's motion. And these experts should be allowed to testify is what they're saying. Let's take a look at this other big exhibit. This is uh, 159 pages. Exhibit 2. This is a transcript from prior court proceeding where they, sounds like they probably talked about this issue. So... They're referencing, that's funny. So they're referencing the, uh, the judge's own language and the court's own ruling and saying, we don't even want a hearing, okay? This, they said this here, a hearing is not necessary. We've already settled this. Look at the transcript. As explained above, these arguments fail on the merits. We've already resolved this is essentially what they're saying without saying it. Okay, and so that was the end point of 1123. So we had about four minute entries here. We just went through these exhibits, one, two, 
Pagliuga entered those. We can see the 1124 docket is still fresh right now. We'll know more about that when it closes on 1125. So make sure that you subscribe to our channel. Make sure you leave us a like and drop a comment below. Is this stuff useful? Do you appreciate going through these a little bit more loosely, the Galen Maxwell stuff? We're going to have a lot to piece together, and so I hope you join us and stick around as we continue to cover it. And I will see you on the next one.